Hello everyone, I'm Huai Gu from Singapore Geophysics Project. In this video, I'm talking about Bohr acoustic full waveform inversion. Hope you can enjoy the video. This is me. I'm a second year PhD student from National University of Singapore. I'm also sponsored by Southern University of Science and Technology. Arthur and Elita are my supervisors in National University of Singapore. Xin Ding is my supervisor in Southern University of Science and Technology. Okay, now let's begin. This research aims at inverting the spatial variations in formation velocities around the borehole from acoustic logging data. First of all, I will briefly introduce acoustic logging. Acoustic logging is a principal geophysical technique to measure the elastic wave velocities of formation. This figure illustrates the principle of acoustic logging. The acoustic logging tool is consists of source and receivers. Source is a transducer generate acoustic waves. Receivers are transducers receive acoustic waves. During the work, the logging tool will be put in the bottom of the well, and then it will be slowly put up to the surface. In this process, Every half foot, the source will send acoustic wave to the borehole fluid. When the acoustic waves travel to the wellbore, they will transform to elastic waves traveling in the formation. The elastic waves include compressional wave or P wave, shear wave or S wave, followed by pseudo Rayleigh wave, and there is also Stoney wave. P wave and S wave are body waves. Pseudo Rayleigh wave and Stoney wave are surface waves only travel along the bell bore. Some energy of the body waves and the surface waves will travel back to the receivers. Then the waves are kept as acoustic logging data. Further, we can obtain elastic wave velocities from this acoustic logging data. This figure shows the schematic of the Halliburton Examiner Sonic Imager. It's an advanced acoustic logging tool. We can see that there are 13 rings of receivers or hydrophones. Each ring contains eight evenly distributed receivers. The interval between the two rings is half foot. There are four monopole sources and a pair of dipole sources located at different planes on the tool. In this research, I'm only using lower near monopole, far monopole, and ultra far monopole sources. Monopole means the source generates acoustic waves equally in all directions. In other words, the waves are as mutually independent. Acoustic logging is one of the acoustic methods you might be more familiar with seismic or ultrasonic. Actually, acoustic logging is also called sonic logging. The basic physics behind the acoustic logging is the same with the other acoustic methods, which is elastic wave equations. The only difference is the frequency band. For monopole acoustic logging data, the frequency of valid signal ranges from 1 kHz to 15 kHz. In this frequency band, the resolution ranges from centimeters to around 1 meter. And the received acoustic waves are mainly affected by rocks around borehole within about 1 meter. Therefore, range of the investigation could be as large as 1 meter. Acoustic logs are results of acoustic logging. The logs are always 1D curves. Usually, the fluctuation on acoustic logs are interpreted as a lithology change along borehole. However, the curves cannot tell velocity change away from borehole. In other words, the acoustic logs only have resolution in axial direction but they do not have resolution in radial direction. However, for seismic, the velocity profiles are always 2D images 
or 3D volumes. We just talked about the acoustic logging data are affected by formation velocity around borehole within about 1 meter. So here we may ask a question. For acoustic logging, whether the velocity away from well bore is important or not, and if it's important, how could we obtain velocity in both axial direction and in radial direction? This slide shows some cases with velocity change around borehole. This is the schematic of well bore fluid intrusion. This means sometimes borehole fluid will intrude into original rocks. Then there will be flushed zone and transition zone. Normally, velocities in flushed zone and the transition zone would be slower than velocities in original rocks. This figure shows that drilling a borehole could change stress distribution in the rocks around the borehole. The change of stress would cause opening or closure of micro cracks in the rocks, which further lead to stiffness variations and velocity variations around borehole. Other cases like borehole damage or shell swelling could also lead to velocity change around wellbore. Therefore, if we could obtain a 2D or even 3D velocity model around borehole, it could provide useful geomechanic information. This is the reason why I propose to use full waveform inversion to obtain elastic wave velocities around borehole. Before talking about full waveform inversion, let's first talk about conventional methods to measure velocity from acoustic logging data. Here I show a simple recording geometry with just two receivers. The spatial interval between the two receivers is delta z. If the formation is homogeneous, we can see that the repass of the first arrived waves are along the veil bore. And the difference between the lengths of the repass is also delta z. So if we want to know the velocity, we also need to measure the time delay of the first arrived waves. Then the velocity could be calculated by delta z over delta t. In the logging industry, usually people prefer to use slowness, which is the reciprocal of velocity. In these slides, I'm using numerical simulation to better explain the idea. The multiple source and an array of receivers are put in the middle of the veil. The borehole fluid is water. The radius of veil bore is 10 cm. If we know the velocities in the formation, we could do numerical simulations by solving elastic wave equations. This animation shows the wave propagation around the veil bore in a 2D slice. This fastest wave is P wave. This is S wave, followed by pseudo Rayleigh waves, and this is Stoney waves. When these waves travel to the position of receivers, they are recorded as synthetic data. The data is called synthetic data because they are not real data. They are come from the numerical simulations. This is the recorded P wave. And this is recorded S wave and pseudo Rayleigh waves. And this is recorded Stoney wave. Next, the velocities or slowness in the formation could be obtained by measuring the slope of the first arrived travel time. During the work, the tool is moving from the bottom to the top in the veil. And there will be thousands of measurements at different depths. So we cannot deal with so many data by drawing the lines manually. We need to find automatic ways to measure the slope of the travel time curves. The standard method to automatically deal with acoustic logging data is called semblance. Semblance calculates velocity according to coherence of waveform in selected time window. I'm not going to talk about the details we just need to know 
The bright points on the semblance panel indicate slowness and the interception type of the elastic waves. Usually, we are not interested in the interception type, so we can stack the 2D panel in time and obtain a curve like this. The peaks on the curve indicate the slowness or velocities of the formation. Let's recall the actual velocity model. We can see the velocities obtained by semblance are very close to the actual values. Semblance is fast and stable. The acoustic logs are just obtained by using semblance. However, semblance result would be inaccurate when formation velocity varies in radial direction. In this example, P-wave velocity is changing from 2,600 meter per second at the well bore to around 3,000 meter per second, one meter away from the well bore. The semblance result would just give a somehow average number. From the semblance result, we could not know the structures of the velocity model. Hornby proposed to use travel time tomography or retracing tomography to obtain P-wave velocity profile around borehole. These figures are grabbed from his paper in 1993. We can see that if the formation is homogeneous, then the repass of the first arrived waves are all along the bell bore. However, if the velocity is changing in radial direction, then the repass would change. In this example, the p-wave velocity is increasing with the increase of distance from well bore. Then the repass for near offset data are close to the well bore, and the repass for far offset data will go through high velocity area far from well bore. If we pick up the first arrived travel time in the data, we can see that the first arrived travel time curve would not be a straight line anymore. It would be a curve whose slope is changing with the change of the offset. From the first arrived travel time curve, the p-wave velocity profile could be inverted by using retracing tomography. However, retracing tomography also has its limitations because the first arrived waves are refracted p-wave or diving p-wave, which cannot propagate in low velocity area. Therefore, if there is a low velocity area in the middle, then the velocity at this area and at the far area cannot be inverted by tomography. In addition, it is difficult to use ray tracing tomography to obtain S-wave profile because it's challenging or even impossible to pick up travel time of S-wave in logging data. Well, full waveform inversion does not have these limitations, and usually it's believed full waveform inversion has better resolution than tomography. Therefore, full waveform inversion has potential to do a better job. Before I talk about full waveform inversion, I would like to stress modeling first. Modeling is another name of numerical simulation. If we know the velocity models, we can solve the elastic wave equations to obtain the data. This process is from model to data, so it's called modeling. In reality, we do not know the velocity models, and we would like to invert the velocity models from the data. So this is called inversion. Inversion is just the other way around of the modeling. Full waveform inversion, or FWI, is one method of the inversion. And actually, tomography is also a kind of inversion. FWI solves a mathematical optimization problem whose objective function is to minimize the difference between the calculated data 
and the real data within the constraint of elastic wave equations. This means we can find a velocity model and obtain synthetic data, or also called calculated data, by modeling. Then we can compare the calculated data with the observed data. The difference between the data is called data residual. If the L2 norm of the data residual is small, this means the velocity model we find is close to the real model. Well, if the data residual is large, this means the velocity model is very different with real model. We need to modify the model to make the data residual small. There are many ways to modify the model, like gradient descent method, counterkate gradient method, and Cauchy Newton method. In this research, I use gradient descent method, which is also called steepest descent method. I use this method because it's simple and stable. For gradient descent method, the most critical procedure is to calculate gradient of objective function with respect to the velocity model. A starting model M0 is also needed. Then the best model could be obtained by iteratively searching in the opposite direction of the gradient. Alpha is used for controlling how much the model should be updated in each iteration. Here I use a simple example to show the idea of gradient descent method. We want to find an M to make objective function J as small as possible. If we know the objective function j when m is given, and we can also calculate the gradient of j with respect to the m, then we can give a starting m and search in the opposite direction of the gradient. Finally, we could find an m to make j converge to a minimum point. However, we can see that the objective function does not converge to the global minimum point, but converge to a local minimum point. If we want to make j converge to the global minimum point, we have to give a better starting model, maybe at here. So a good starting model is also very important for FWI. From these slides, we know that FWI finds the velocity model by matching the waveforms of calculated data and observed data. Therefore, not only travel time, but all the information in data are used. This is the reason why FWI does not have the limitation of tomography. This is the workflow of the Stapesis Decent FWI. Actually, I'm not the inventor of FWI. FWI was proposed in 1980s for seismic velocity model building. In this research, my contribution is to revise the algorithm from conventional Curtisian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates to better fit the borehole environment. Because of the limitation of time, I cannot go through the details. I'm working on a journal paper with the same topic of this slice. Later, you can check the paper for the details if you are interested. I will give some examples to show the applicability of the FWI using acoustic logging data. This is an example of a formation with three layers. Assume we do not know the velocity models. We would like to invert the velocity models from the observed data. The starting model is built based on semblance analysis. The semblance results of near offset data are used for estimating velocity near the well bore. The semblance results of ultra far offset data are used for estimating velocity far away from well bore. So I just set the velocities at the well bore as the values obtained by using near offset results and set the velocities at 1 meter away from the well bore as the velocities obtained by ultra-far offset results. 
Then the 2D velocity models are obtained by linear interpolation. Now we have the starting models. We can use FWI to update the velocity models iteratively. These are the inverted velocity models after 50 iterations. We can see that they are very close to the true velocity models. This is a more realistic case. The true velocity model is smoothly changing in both axial direction and in radial direction. And the recording geometry is totally follows the working mode of Harley Burton examiner imager. The starting model is also built by sentence analysis. We can see that the inverted models converge to true velocity model gradually. The high velocity area is retrieved by FWI. More details and FWI results for real logging data could be found in our journal paper. If there's anything you want to talk to me, leave your message below. Looking for your recommendations and comments. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.